Welcome to Grace Abounds. I'm Pastor Jen Shaw, and in this podcast, I'm sharing my Sunday sermons from St. John's Lutheran Church, Palm Desert, California. I'm so grateful that you've joined us, and I trust that these words build you up in faith, hope, and love. When I was at Fuller Seminary, I took a class entitled Conversion and the Process of Change. And in that class, Dr. Richard Peace introduced us to the work of Paul Hybert, who had served as a missionary in India and also taught at Fuller Seminary in the 80s. In his work, Hybert explores the question, how do we define being a Christian? How do we know when someone's a Christian? How do we know if someone's a Christian? How would you answer that question? Hybert wrote that our answer is informed by how we define Christian. If we see Christian as a bounded set It is defined by the boundary. People are either in or they're out. Either they're Christian or they're not. And everyone on the inside is the same, a Christian, and everyone on the outside is the same, a non-Christian. And there's no movement on either side. Again, you're either in or you're out. And you just simply go from being one to being the other. Being a Christian is defined by the boundary, wherever we may place it. But if we see Christian... as a centered set, it is defined by the center. By Jesus Christ. The boundary is not the point. Everyone is moving around the center Jesus. And we're all different, and we're all in different places in our faith journey, and there's movement. It's dynamic. Being a Christian is defined by the center, by Christ, and not by any boundaries we may establish regarding who's in and who's out. As the Lord himself makes known to Peter and the early church in our reading from Acts 11. Peter, who is always listed first among the 12 apostles in the Gospels, spent three years with Jesus during Jesus' public ministry, learning from him how to be like him, how to do what he did, how to teach as he taught. Peter saw Jesus speak with the Samaritan woman at the well and invite himself over for dinner with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and heal the daughter of and affirm the faith of a Seraphonician Gentile woman. Peter saw Jesus touch lepers and forgive sinners and welcome children and widows. Peter saw Jesus feed the hungry and heal the sick and free people from demonic oppression. And Peter was called by Jesus to do the same. Jesus told Peter he would be the rock, Greek Petros, Peter, upon which Christ would build his church. And Jesus commissioned Peter 
to tend the sheep of the early and growing Christian community. And on Pentecost Sunday, 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, preached the good news of Jesus Christ, the God of all creation in the flesh, who joined with us in our humanity, who lived a life of grace and truth, who showed us and taught us love, who suffered and died on the cross and was buried and on the third day rose again to life, taking our sin and death as his own and giving us his salvation and life eternal. He ascended into heaven. And one day, as Revelation 21 so beautifully envisions, he will come again and make his home among us. He will make all things new. He will bring death and mourning and suffering to an end. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. Peter dedicated himself to this good news. And after Pentecost Sunday, he continued to preach and teach and heal. He went here and there among all the saints, as the author Luke writes in Acts 9 a journey that led him to the coastal city of Joppa, where he stayed in the home of Simon the Tanner, where he brought a disciple named Tabitha back from death to life, where he had a vision that expanded his understanding of God's boundless grace. As Peter later recounts, to his fellow Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who criticize him because Peter goes out of bounds, that is, he eats with Gentiles, those who are not Jewish. Peter was on the roof of the home of Simon the Tanner, a man whose profession would have made him ritually unclean because he handled dead animals turning their hides into leather. Peter is praying. And then he has a vision. A sheet is lowered from heaven, filled with unclean animals. And the voice from heaven says to Peter, take and eat. Peter refuses, saying that he has never eaten anything unclean. Peter is a devout Jewish man who here references in scripture to the Lord specifically Leviticus 11, which states, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron to speak to the people of Israel saying, and there follows a list of animals that the people of God were not to eat. Animals like pigs and shrimp and catfish, among others. For a devout Jewish person, To eat these unclean foods was to break the law of God. And not eating these foods led to the practice of not eating with people who ate these foods, that is, Gentiles, who themselves came to be considered unclean, lawbreakers, sinners, outside of the boundary of God's people, not the kind of people we hang out with. But the voice of the Lord from heaven says to Peter, what God has called clean, you must not call unclean. Here we have in scripture an account of the Lord himself changing Peter's mind about scripture, about our legalistic interpretations that establish boundaries about who's in and who's out. As Peter's vision ends, three men from Caesarea, a city about 40 miles up the coast from Joppa, arrive at the house of Simon the Tanner and ask for Peter. They've been sent there by a man named Cornelius, a Gentile, a Roman centurion, described by the author Luke, who was himself a Gentile, as a devout man who worshiped God and gave generously to the poor and prayed constantly to the Lord. 
He, Cornelius, had had a vision in which an angel told him to send for Peter. And when Peter finally arrives in the home of a Gentile by divine intervention and begins to preach the gospel to Cornelius and all the members of his household, the Holy Spirit falls on them as the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples at Pentecost, and Peter baptizes them in the name of Jesus Christ, and they all hang out together for a few more days. As Peter makes clear, this was all the Lord's idea. Peter says to Cornelius and his household, I truly understand. The Lord shows no partiality. Peter later says to his fellow Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, who do eventually rejoice that God's grace has been given even to the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit was given to them just as the Holy Spirit was given to us. Peter will later say at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, the council that finally decided as a church body that Gentile people as well as Jewish people, so that is everybody, is welcome in the community of Christ. God makes no distinction between them and us. In other words, the Lord is not limited by whatever boundaries we may establish. God, our creator, loves everyone and everything he has made. As Psalm 148 declares, the sun and moon and shining stars, the trees and mountains and rainwaters, the cattle and fish and flying birds, all glorify God in their being. God, the Holy Spirit, the breath of life who fills and sustains us, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, is at work in and through each and every and all of us. God the Son, Jesus Christ, came to save us all. No one is outside of the boundary of God's grace. No one is outside of the circle of God's care. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Beloved, since God loves us so much, we ought also to love one another. As Jesus teaches his disciples, as we heard in John 13. On the night he was betrayed and arrested, as he was preparing to demonstrate his boundless love in giving his life for ours, as he was preparing his disciples for what was to come, Jesus said to them, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. Jesus does not say, the people will know we're his followers by our doctrinal beliefs, or our moral code, or our church traditions. Those things are important, but they are not what define us as followers of Christ. Love is what defines us as followers of Christ. The love of Christ flowing through us, divine, generous, boundless love, agape love. Love as described by the Apostle Paul who himself had a vision that expanded his understanding of God's boundless grace for all people. In 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind and respectful. Love does not insist on its own way. Love doesn't keep score. 
Love doesn't celebrate when someone fails. Love celebrates the truth. Love looks for the best and never gives up and trusts in God. Love is not simply an emotion. It is an intention. Love sees and treats every single human being as a person made in the glorious image of God with dignity and value and worth. Love seeks the good of everyone and everything God has made. Love does not classify people as clean or unclean, worthy or unworthy, people we should hang out with and people we really shouldn't. Love is bigger than that. Love is boundless. Love never ends. Once when I was preaching in the middle of a sermon, a gentleman who was sitting three or four pews back leaned over to his wife and said something, loud enough that I could hear he was talking, but not quite loud enough that I could make out the words. Later after the service, when we were chatting in the back, the woman who was sitting behind them asked me if I'd heard what he said. And when I said no, she said that his words were, it really is all about love, isn't it? It really is. As the Lord himself makes known to Peter, as Jesus teaches his disciples, as the Holy Spirit is reminding us here and now, the question is not who's in and who's out of whatever boundaries we may establish. The question is, are we moving ever closer to the center of love who is Jesus Christ as we share his love with each other. Thanks for listening. We're doing this every week, so make sure to subscribe. If you'd like more information about St. John's mission to know Christ and make Christ known, visit our website, stjohnslutheran.church. May God bless you on this day and in all the days ahead.